All right. So many people. <laughs> Hey, good, what is it, afternoon? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, shoot, welcome to this demo. Uh, my name is Mark Schonegel. I'm a senior developer advocate at Unity, and uh, I think I have one of the coolest things in the world to show, uh, which is this enemies demo. I'm gonna show you kind of a making of. How many of you have seen this? Well, you're gonna see it again. So before I even get started, I wanna show you the final piece. Um, so this is actually going to render I mean, this is more impressive anyway. This is gonna render in 4K, it'll be downscaled, um, all ray traced, the ambient occlusion, global illumination, uh, reflections ray traced, and all being rendered on the fly on this machine below me. It does have a fairly nice graphics card in it so that we can do the real time ray tracing. Um, I'm gonna shut up. I have in my head everything that anyone has ever known. You have in your heart everything anyone has ever felt. Power is given only to those who dare to lower themselves and pick it up. That was Enemies again. You can find that on YouTube. You can see it in all its glory. Go home, put it on your 4K TV, crank the volume up and uh, watch that again because it's definitely worth a few a few looks. Uh, it was interesting, I was at the booth earlier today and I heard these these people whispering behind my ears and they were, boy, her compositing doesn't look good. Like, I can see the green screen on her hair. Like, no, that's all 3D. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. Anyway, uh, I'm not gonna do a whole lot of PowerPoint, but just a couple slides. Uh, creating a realistic, photorealistic digital human has been one of the biggest challenges, I think, in all of 3D. Uh, we're pretty good at it when it comes to pre-rendered. You know, you can throw it through Nuke, you can render it all out and make it look amazing. But when you're trying to do that real time where you could look at that for any perspective and see it at that quality is a huge challenge. So the demo team started uh, back in 2019 doing a realistic human with Gwen and the Heretic. If you haven't seen that, you can find that on YouTube as well. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have hair back then. I don't have hair now, but Gwen didn't have hair and uh, the team had to actually invent a hair system. So I am super thrilled today and I'll talk more about it. But day before yesterday, after two hard years of work, uh, the Unity hair system is now out on GitHub for everybody to use. Uh, it is awesome. It does all sorts of crazy hair. It does fur, animals, short hair, long hair, curly hair, weird, wacky, crazy SIGGRAPH hair. Uh, it all can do it. It's pretty awesome. The guy who invented it is named Lasse, and he is here at the show. So if you get a chance to congratulate him, do that. Um, so yeah, so we started with Gwen, and Gwen was amazing, but again, he didn't have the hair. So for this demo, the team decided to uh, to do something a little bit more challenging. Pick a middle-aged woman with had uh, you know a few wrinkles and a few blemishes, as opposed to someone with porcelain smooth skin. And uh, they really challenged themselves, and I think the efforts, as you saw, kind of speak for themselves. So anyway. How do you make a 4D character or a, a, a 3D character through a 4D pipeline? 4D pipeline basically means that you scan ahead and create a 3D model from it. Um, since I don't have all that equipment here, I can only show you that with slides. So there's basically three steps. You acquire the data. We used a company, um, a service provider called Infinite Realities to do that. 
We process it using uh, another service provider, R3DS, and then we were delivered the final head, which we then took it through the pipeline, which is what I'm going to show you today. Uh, basically, the data acquisition starts off like this. We uh, have this actress here and put a bunch of little dots on her face, put her through this torture of having blinding light from all different angles at 30 frames, 60 frames a second with 60 cameras, and we captured about 30 minutes of her performance. Um, from there, it was cleaned up, and we were delivered a mesh that looks something like this. Uh, this becomes an Alembic cache. If you know what Alembic is, it's just a file format that can easily stream into Unity. Uh, and we were basically given this to then shade, bring it into Unity, add some of the stuff that I'm going to show you here shortly, like the skin tension solver. Um, there we see the normal map detail, which I'll show you in the editor. It's far more exciting. Uh, yeah, so that's all I really want to show you. But what we're going to cover is the eye shader, the digital human toolkit for the hair, um, ray tracing and DLSS, NVIDIA's deep learning super sampling, which makes this run nice and quick. Uh, the skin tension solver, probe volumes, and that's it. We're done with PowerPoint. Uh, really quick, just to find some of this stuff. I know you can't click links on my magical screen here, but that's where you can find some of these tools. The digital human toolkit, just search Unity digital human toolkit and you'll find it. Uh, and then if you're looking for the new hair, you can find that um, with that URL there. Let y'all get your photos. So that's it. Let's go. Do, do, do. Let's get into the editor. So here we go. There is, uh, that's enemies. It is a single contained project. There are no cuts or wipes or changes to a different scene. It is all contained in one scrubbable timeline like we see here, which is pretty remarkable in itself um, that this entire cinematic is completely encompassed like that. One of the coolest things I love in this thing, and I'll, I'll start with it, is the eye shader. Um, so I'm just going to go here to my good old web browser real quick. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about the eye shader in general. So Unity, of course, has HDRP, which is the High Definition Rendering Pipeline. And that ships with an eye shader. It does a lot of stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of documentation. I actually learned a lot. I didn't know what a Limbus was. I didn't know what a Sclera was. Uh, found all that out. Lets you make all sorts of cool eyes, evil eyes, not so evil eyes, fully documented. Well, when the demo team used this for the heretic, they kind of found out that it didn't quite do everything that they wanted to do. So I'm going to show you a quick little video of the eye tech. So the, the eye shader on the right is the default eye shader that, uh, that shipped with, um, with the HDRP. For this one here, they added the ability to have energy, basically, because Unity is a physically based renderer. But what happens is uh, sometimes at certain angles, the eye becomes completely washed out with light, like we see here in the, in the middle. Um, so what they did for this version of the eye shader, which is all going to be released here in just a month or so, is they added caustics. And you can see that all right in there. So I'm going to show you that in the editor really quick. But this is just the progression of the three different eye shaders that, uh, that have been developed. The stock one, the one that's available in the middle currently in the Digital Human Toolkit, and then the one that will be, uh, that will be released very soon. And oh, I wish I had a different edit thing install. There we go. I don't want to look at movies. I want to get back to this. Cool. So let's take a look at the eye shader in here. Uh, so I'm just going to type the word eye, and that will isolate her eye. Grab this one here, and oops, get that guy out. Okay, there. Mm. I have the weirdest mouse right now. Anyway, let's go to scene, and I'll frame up on her eyeball. And if I zoom in, wow, oh, my mouse. Oops. Arr. I swear I know how to drive. You would be amazed at what my mouse is doing right now. I'm telling it to do none of what it's doing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Anyhow, all right. So if I rotate around, we see this absolutely gorgeous eye. Look at the reflections in there. We got this wetness under there, the wetness in here. Uh, look at the reflections we've got. So all you really need to create an eye like this is a piece of geometry that has that bulge in there. That's it, one piece of geometry. And then you throw a couple shaders on it or a couple textures, rather. And let me just open that up here. Oh, let me undo that. Grab that eye. Why it's not refreshing? Cool. Open this up. And we have these four texture maps. So these four texture maps basically are what create that eye. So this is the sclera. Again, I only re learned what a sclera was. Uh, that's basically you know the blood and the white in your eye. Uh, we have the iris, which is this here. We have the bump map for the sclera. And hopefully, we'll be able to see that. It's a really fine little detail to get these little blood veins in there that have a little bit of roughness. Um, and then we have a, a bump map for the iris as well. So you put all four of those textures together, and then you get 
this. So these are all the parameters that you can adjust with the brand new eye shader. Um, the one that comes stock has maybe 10 of these. So it's really cool that what the demo team does is they push these tools to the envelope, they add to them, they enhance them, and then they release them to the community, which I think is fantastic. So some of the things you can do just right off the bat that are really easy to see, and I think let me unselect that eye so we can, let me pin this really quick. I'll unselect it so we don't see that orange thing around it. Perfect, we'll just focus on the eye. So if I rotate the sclera, you can see that's really, you know, you clearly see what that's doing. And let me see if I can find a little bit of bump. Maybe you can see this on the projector. There's a little bit of bump on each one of these little bloodlines, which just adds that little bit of believability, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. Some other things that are really simple to see are like the pupil scale. You can, uh, you know, oof, or something like that. And all of these, of course, are animatable. You can animate these with Timeline. Timeline is this tool down here, which you saw me scrub earlier. Um, if I go down here, this is the, uh, the ASG. That stands for Antistropic Spherical Gaussian. Say that 10 times fast. All of these parameters here, all they do are figure out the occlusion of the eye eyebrow or the, that, the meat of your eye right there or your, your, your skin and how it leaves this little, little line right there. These tiny, tiny, crazy little details are what make this so realistic. You, you omit any one of these and you start to get that uncanny valley of, well, that doesn't look right, why? Well, because maybe my ASG power wasn't enough or it's too little or, or something. So you gotta get that right where it's perfect. And to have all these artistic controls is, is just awesome. Uh, we can keep scrolling down. Some of this stuff down here, this is all brand new for, the, for version three, things like caustic intensity and caustic blending. Um, caustics, hopefully you all know what caustics are. If you jump into a swimming pool and you see all those little dancing shimmering lines on the ceiling, that's caustics, it's how light um, goes through transparent and refractive objects and then intensifies, kind of like what's happening with these lights in my glasses. I have caustics right now in my head and yeah, so if I adjust that, we should see I'm changing the blending of how that caustic, how that energy, it's actually the energy bouncing around inside the eyeball, which it's just bonkers. Uh, I can tune down the intensity, change the blending. You can really get very creative and very artistic, but at the end of the day, you can achieve that photorealistic look, which, I mean, that's just awesome. Uh, I was dorking around with the eyes for a while. There's so many controls. Uh, I can't take you through all of them, but you know, it's just cool that they're all in there. This version of the eye shader with caustics will be out as soon as 23, 2023.1 alpha comes out in about two months. Uh, the day that drops, all of these new shaders will drop as well. So hair is available today. Uh, the rest of the shaders I'm gonna show you will be available very, very soon. So cool on that. Uh, let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit. And let's go to a different frame here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the hair. Uh, hair is, I mean, this is real time hair. That in itself is pretty amazing that we can do that now with these, these fancy GPUs. Uh, but this actually runs really nice on even like an NVIDIA 20 series GPU. So I have the 30, 30 series only because I'm doing ray tracing. Um, but this stuff runs really fast, even runs on mobile, runs on URP. It's not just an HDRP hair uh, tool set. And again, this is, was released just a couple days ago. So all of you can go and mess around with hair um, right now. So just gonna show you a couple things in here. Let me just unpin this and let's just take a look at her hair groom. Grab this one here. And I've got all these parameters for hair. So the ability to do all these different types of hair requires a tremendous amount of tools. Um, there are some things that even, so there's a clock inside. Uh, just like you have in physics, we run at 30, 60, 120 hertz, or you can set a custom clock rate. Just changing the clock rate changes a lot of the, the way that the hair system works. So you didn't need to spend a little bit of time on it, learn some of these parameters. I'm gonna show you what some of them do, but Basically, you can achieve anything. I'm gonna show you a little video in a sec of just some of this stuff. If I scrub a little bit, notice that these two sliders here, gravity and global position are animated. So those are just animated with timeline. And you can see when the chest pieces fly up, her hair does that cool gravity deal as well. And it all comes come crashing down. Uh, if I back up just a bit, let me just reduce the gravity here right there in the slider. Look at that. So it's all real time. It behaves very quickly. This scene is obviously very heavy. Um, so I'm gonna go and load a different scene here in a second, and just kind of show you how you set up hair from scratch. But it is very interactive. I can mess around here in, you know, in my fully, uh, fully created scene. If I close this really quick, let's close this too. <clears throat> I wanna show you a quick little video. This came in hot. This was just finished last night, some of the stuff in here. This is just gonna show you some of the stuff that you can do with the new hair system. So check this out.
That is Gwen from The Heretic. He finally decided to shave and not shave his head. Cartoony hair. Even animals. This is live on the show floor. That's not real. That's Ziva and the new hair tool. Crazy cool. Those are LODs, so as the camera gets close, farther and closer, you can control the amount of strands you're simulating. It can get crazy. <laughs> Pretty cool. Hey, thank you. I agree. <clears throat> and again, I'm, I'm going to say probably a dozen times, you can do that today. So go to that link, download it. Uh, on, it's it, just, just do it. Sorry, I get, I get a little excited sometimes. Uh, I want to show you a little hair setup using a little hair playground scene. Um, Nothing special, but uh, just to show you how you set it up, and I'll show you some of the different types of things you can do with the hair. So really off the bat, just right click and say create, and I wanna create hair, cool. Hair asset, boom. And I get this dialog box here, this uh, inspector view. Uh, first thing I'll do is say build strand groups. And that's gonna build a little, come on. There is something really wacky with the machine. Stuff is going, my mouse is jittery, so I have kind of apologized, but we'll get through this, no problem. Anyway, this is my little, this is a curtain of hair. Not many strands, there's only 64 strands making this little, little curtain. Uh, it's color coded in this little RGB just so you can kind of see what's going on. We can obviously put a shader on that. If I increase the strand count, tell it to build it again, it becomes solid. Uh, I'll turn this on auto, and that way I don't have to hit this build button anymore. So you can lower that and increase that. Uh, but instead of using a primitive curtain, let's do a brush. And so now I get this little kind of a brush deal. And maybe it'll increase the strand count some more, increase the length a little bit. And this is sort of the starting of the building block, building block of a basic primitive hair. Now, what do I mean by a primitive hair? I just mean that we're using these four things that we've given to you. So a curtain, a brush, a cap, and a stratified curtain. You can also say, hey, I wanna sprout this from a mesh, or I could even say I wanna sprout it from an alembic cache. And that again is what we use for her hair, for her. So as, her, as she streams in, that hair is gonna grow from her head as off of that cache. Um, so from here, let's just keep it the way it is. I'll show you with a brush in here, and then we'll do something a little more complicated. So how do I get this brush into here? Well, I've created the asset. So now what I'll do is I will create an empty game object, so I at least have a, something to hold it, add a component. My standard Unity components are here. I'm gonna whittle this down to hair. I said whittle, that's funny. Uh, hair instance, and now it's giving me all of those parameters for hair. I just need to tell it what hair asset do I actually wanna put in there. So. This is the hair asset that I just created. Drag and drop it into there, and boom, now I've got hair. Look at that. Simple, super easy to set up, and now I can grab my manipulator, spin that around. It's very fast, it's very interactive. Uh, things like collisions, don't even have to set that up. Just grab a manipulator, pull this up just a hair, ha, get it, hair, and we'll just slide that over. We didn't see that very good, let's get that better. So we've got all nice collision detection, don't have to even set those up as colliders, it just magically works. Uh, let's go and set that length just a bit longer so you can see that, maybe not that long. And it just slides right over like so. Um, so that's, you know, it'll fall on our shoulders, it'll fall on their face, whatever, it just slides right off uh, without you doing anything. So you can see it moves very quickly. I've got uh, 14,000 strands, that's quite a lot of strands. I can get this up into 50,000, 60,000, 100,000, and it still moves very, very quickly. So you can do massive heads of hair. Um, some other things I can do on there, let's just add a little bit of, uh, of a curl. So we got some curly hair. I can make that longer, and as I make it longer, the curls kind of straighten out or, or widen, tighten them back up like so. Uh, I'm gonna reduce the particle count quite a bit, or the strand count rather, and I wanna talk to you about the particles. So hopefully you can see this, but these strands on the outside, See how they have these, these sharp kinks to them? So the hair system is based off of particles. Particle, 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 and it draws strands through those particles. Each particle has to make a sharp angle to get to the next particle. Well, nobody, I hope, has hair that's all angular and janky like that. I can actually go down here to my debug mode, and I can say, you know what, show me those particles. And each one of those little dots is a particle. Um, I hope you can see, oh yeah, you see they're pretty good. Cool, so I'll turn those off. Well. Instead of going up here and cranking up the particle count, 
Now, if you do prank, crank the particle count up, it doesn't get crazy slow, but every one of those particles is a calculation, and it gets exponentially more expensive to calculate as you add more particles. So just like we have subdivision surfaces on, say, polygons, we can subdivide our hair. So if I take this subdivision slider and move it, all those hairs get nicely curved with almost zero extra rendering costs or, or calculation costs because we're just smoothing that curve. That's a simple algorithm as opposed to trying to figure out where that other point needs to go, which is a whole bunch of calculations. This gives you nice smooth curly or yeah, smooth curly hair without uh, without the the cost of uh, you know of rendering them or or uh, adding more particles. So that's very cool. So it's very efficient as I've shown. Um, Lots of other stuff in here. One thing I find really cool is some of the debug tools we have. As I showed you the particle one, this one here is pretty neat. I'm going to move this grid down to about halfway. And let's just set the, uh, let's just set our curl. Let's get rid of the curls real quick. And I want to show you how hair kind of influences other strands. So as you have two hairs that get closer and closer, as you add more hairs, they actually start to push away from each other because they don't want to collide. So they're going to push against each other. And you can visualize sort of when that happens and how that happens. So check this out. If I go to my strand diameter and I start to increase the diameter, it turns white. White tells you that, hey, you're getting really close to having exerting pressure on the next strand over. And if I go further, now I'm actually exerting that pressure and the hair starts to react. Super useful tool when you're actually doing a real hair to find that sweet spot to where you're not in the red, but you're just kind of on the fringe of it. Um, and again, a lot of these, these tools, as you get to use the hair system, they kind of make a lot more sense. So I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but a lot to cover in a short time to do it. So um, what else can I show you on here? Oh, let's show you motion vectors. Motion vectors are cool. Uh, display, strand velocities. I just like, uh, I like visualizing data, like look at that. So those are the motion vectors for the hair, which is, <laughs> Just to show that much data in real time is just pretty crazy. But anyway, cool debug modes. Lots of that stuff to do with or uh, that you can play with. Let me get rid of this guy real quick. And let me show you now, like maybe with a, a bit more realistic head. So I'll grab the, uh, I'll grab the hair from, or the head from, uh, from our demo. There we go. Mm -mm -mm. Spin this around. Cool. So there we have, call her Louise. And if I take Louise, and I rotate her, you should see the hair nicely move around, cool. Uh, and notice that it kind of goes back to its same position and that there seems to be like clumps. Uh, these clumps of hair are actually something that you define in other packages. So rather than do these grooms, you don't groom the hair in Unity, you groom the hair in Mac or uh, in Maya. Uh, Blender has some really cool grooming tools I saw today at the show. Um, uh, Houdini has blending tools, and Unity has uh, Weta's technology now, so we have Barbershop, which is one of their internal tools for doing grooms. That's going to be available soon. So lots of different ways you actually do the grooms. Let me show you really quickly what I mean by that, which is, let's just go show you how you, for instance, style this in Maya. So here we are in Maya. You have your head, you, you grow the hair in Maya, and then you just start to define these clumps, and you move it all around. Once that's done, that's what you bring into Unity, and then you simulate it, add your materials to it, and there you go. So don't need to watch too much of how you create grooms off of video. So I will close that up. Let's go back into our scene. And let's start to, uh, to play with some other stuff here. So if I expand this, if I select her head, and oh, I got to do one thing here. She is a prefab. In order for me to play with that, I got to unpack it. So there we go. So now I can modify these a little bit. So I have some different grooms here. Um, Pin that down, cool. So we have this groom, we have this groom, and we actually tried like 20, 30 different styles and before we narrowed down to what we wanted for, uh, for, our, for our video there. So here we have a, a more longer one. Um, this is the one that's in, is in enemies. And then there's this one. And then there's this one. So this isn't like fifth element stuff. There's actually a reason we did this. Uh, if you want a really perfectly defined part, what an, uh, a cool little trick to do is set up two systems, one that does that side and one that does this side. But what's nifty about the hair simulator is you can have as many of these hair grooms that are using the same dynamic system in one scene. I'll, it makes more sense if I show it. So check this out. We're going to have this one on one. So I'll just close that up. And now I'm going to say I want another hair system. So I just click on this, or hair groom rather. Sorry, that's important, system versus groom. So now I'll add the second one. So there we go. So now I have the 
Oops, select her again. I unselected her somehow, grab that. So now we have, if I expand this over, you'll see this better, the left and the right hair asset. So the left and the right, just like I showed you. And now if I grab her and spin her, it still behaves the same, but that part is really defined. And, and you know those are two separate grooms, which is nice. Uh, what happens if we add something like maybe her eyebrows? Let's do that. Let's put her eyebrows on there. So I'll add another one. And we will click on here, and we'll add her eyebrow. Ooh. Well, that looks weird. Kind of zoom in there. <laughs> They're really floppy. Uh, let's, let's see what happens when we move this. Oh yeah, so that doesn't, that doesn't look good at all. So the reason for that is all three of these hair grooms are using the same dynamics. They're using the same physics, the same everything to, to animate them. So what I can do to fix this is the following. I'm going to delete the one I just added, so we'll just click minus. I wouldn't do this in production, what I'm going to do, but it makes for a quick demo, and I think you'll, you'll kind of get an idea why. So I'm going to duplicate the geometry of her whole body and head. That should introduce a bunch of Z-fighting, as hopefully you all know what Z-fighting is, but because they have the same material, we're not seeing the Z-fighting. So just pretend it didn't do that. Uh, it just makes for a really quick way to explain this. So I'm going to delete or, or get rid of the left and right ones on this new head, and instead I'm going to replace it with the eyebrows, like so. Well, now what I can do is on this second head, which has only the eyebrows on it, I can change all of the dynamic parameters because now I have two separate simulations going on, one for the main head of hair, one for the eyebrows. So all I have to do to make those behave like real eyebrows, just make them really stiff, crank the iterations up a little bit. Now if I grab this and rotate it, the eyebrows are now locked like real eyebrows. The rest of the hair is behaving correctly. I uh, mean, you should just watch Beavis' butthead, do a little bit of head banging, whatever. Um, Cool, so you can really create as many of these hair systems as you want. Uh, each of your different characters can have different systems. You can have multiple systems on the same character, and you can even do stuff like peach fuzz. So I don't know if you noticed that. I'll show it to you when we're back in the edit or back in the other scene, but we have peach fuzz, peach fuzz, like so. Isn't that crazy? Obviously the shading, what's going on? Obviously the shading is off. Uh, for, I just have a kind of a default shader on that so you can see that really clearly. Peach fuzz, you'd want to be very subtle, very translucent. Um, what's amazing about the peach fuzz is that for a normal main head of hair, you're just going to grow that out of a skull cap. So just kind of define where her hairline is and have it grow out of that cap because it doesn't deform. You know, your head's kind of hard, right? That doesn't move. It's not mushy like a, maybe like a baby would be mushy, but you wouldn't want to do that. But like the main face that talks, right, that's going to be squishy tissue. So it's really, to do this in real time is crazy to have the face deform and have all that fur deform with it at 60 frames, 90 frames a second, whatever you're rendering, rendering at. So the team developed a skin glue kind of a tool that does all that in real time, super fast, super efficient as well. So as she's in the other video where she's talking and moving, all those little peach fuzz, bit, peach fuzz bits move along accurately as well, which super crazy optimizations uh, to get that to work. So. Anyway, that's a little bit on how you create a hair system. Um, that should get you started when you go home and play with this. So we're going to leave this scene, and we will go back to what we were looking at here. And let me just go into the scene view and just zoom in and take a look at that peach fuzz. Those are lips, but look at that, all that little peach fuzz on there. You probably didn't even notice that. Uh, lips. <laughs> cool. All right, so what else can I show you? Let's go here. Let's go back to game view. Uh, what did I want to talk about next? Maybe we should talk about some rendering stuff. So everything in here is ray traced, as I mentioned. Um, you can do selective things. You can be really kind of creative with how you, how you ray trace and what you ray trace. Come on, mouse, move. <laughs> so go here, close that up, and let me go back to our main scene and just kind of set this up a little bit. Uh, I want to get to, actually, you know, the easiest is to do this. Let's go to frame here. So you can see we've got this kind of blue little effect going on behind her. All of the reflections that we see on here are actually ray traced from this effect going on behind her. So if I were to go and open it up and start to tune that, we should be able to see these reflections change. So let's go, and I'm just going to find a shader in here. It's this one here, glass material one. Let's go to this here. And if I change this, we should see on the table, all that change happens as well. So this entire scene is final quality ray trace, which is crazy. Um, any change I make, you kind of see it, you know, kind of, you see it update right there in the viewport. Um, this whole effect, this kind of a Moray effect behind her, 
where we've got this texture that's moving. Um, notice all the, the color is all correct here on all this, the shiny bits here, again, on the table as well. Well, this whole effect is a shader. Um, so I can come down here and I can start to change some of the, some of the things that make this look the way it does. We were looking for like a, like a jumbotron more sort of like a, you kind of see that little more effect. So I can change some of this. So if I change the resolution multiplier, we should see, oh, let me change this, this texture first. Let's go here. Let's grab a new texture for the pixel. Yep, let's go here. Grab, say, this one. And maybe if I change the scale here, we'll see that better. So yeah, so if I change now this texture, change it to this one. We were really trying to, trying to get something that looks like you're looking at you know, an RGB pixel under like a, like a magnifying glass or something. So we get that cool Moria, Moria effect. You know, if you actually look at a LCD screen, that's what each pixel looks like, right? It's a RGB color. Get close enough and you can actually see that. So we were going for that effect. Uh, I think they really nailed it. I love the way it looks. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff we can change here. There's noise. Uh, if we go here to my scene view, and let's just back out a bit. Where are we? Oh, let me just grab our head and that'll frame that up. Mm -mm -mm. There we go, a little top down of her. Yeah, so there we go. And if I go back now to edit that piece, actually, let me just scrub this really quick. Yeah, so we see that on the table as well. Um, we go back here and grab some of these other pictures, pixels. Let me grab that shader again. That guy. That guy should have blocked this down. All right, cool. Let's continue on. So, yeah, again, this whole shader was done with, uh, with the shader tree. So if I go up here and click edit, we should get this crazy shader tree. So this looks a lot more complicated in it than it is. The engineer who made this doesn't like to clean things up. Uh, so I'll show you another one that's much more straightforward. But this is kind of this, this node-based system where you only expose the parameters that you're working with. This is how I like to work anyway. Like all my shader graphs just look like that. But you can go in there and it's just connecting a bunch of dots together to create all sorts of different shader effects, um, which is pretty nifty. So that's cool. Let's go back to our game view and let's just back out a little bit. Um, talk about a couple other rendering things. Let's go and let's just open my main camera. One of the neat things that, uh, that our friends at NVIDIA have created for us is something called DLSS, or Deep Learning Super Sampling. Uh, deep Learning Super Sampling is basically using artificial intelligence to increase the resolution of, of, of a rendering without actually taxing the, the, the frame, or without with increasing the frame rate. So you basically render something at, I don't know, 3K, but it does some artificial intelligence to render it up to 4K. So your frame rates increase without, your, your uh, pixel size increases without increasing. Oh my gosh, I'm getting that completely wrong. You know, let me just show you. Let me just show you. So if you like your, select your main camera, and we go up here to allow dynamic resolution, turn on DLSS. If I play this back, we should see. Oh, let me turn the music off. We don't need to see the sound. So you kind of get an idea how fast that's running. If I put the stats on, they don't, they're not right because DLSS kind of overrides that. But if I turn this off, turn off DLSS and play it back, even in the editor, you can see it's a lot more stuttery. Uh, in the frame buffer, I'm actually rendering this at 4K and then it's displaying it in here. This is a 1080 or almost 1080 or a little bit higher than 1080p. So it is rendering in 4K and then, and then uh, squishing it down inside the viewport there. But you can see it's kind of chugging along. You turn DLSS on, and it's just that much faster. It's still kind of slugging. That's weird. Uh, anywho, so that's a quick little thing inside your executable. Holy cow, is it faster. Like, you can set that just as an option for a user to, uh, to turn on or off. Uh, AMD has a solution coming out as well, which will, of course, support in here for the next release. Uh, I can turn that on. You see it just flickers for a second, and then it should update. It's actually pixel perfect. If you take a native 4K rendering and put it next to a DLSS 4K rendering, even though it only rendered about 3K of those pixels, they look picture perfect, which, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, cool, what else did I wanna show you? Oh, I don't wanna show you render probes. So there's a new lighting technique uh, that we have here in Unity called probe volumes. And if I go here to my render debugger, go to probe volume, and turn on display probes. 
that happened. Oof, what just happened there? Well, all these big spheres just appeared, which we can't see anything because they're just set to a probe size of one. So let's just set these to 0 0.2. And holy cow, what are we looking at? Uh, these are probe volumes. So what a probe volume is, it's think of like a, like a light map, but like on steroids. So a light map, you know, that was great 10 years ago and we had low geometry counts. We didn't, you know, we weren't trying to light all these individual little crevices and everything. Um, so instead of having like a ton of, of normal lights in here, what we can do is just define a volume. So in this case, we defined a, a cube and then you just say, fill it up with probe volumes. It does have to bake. So this takes about 10 minutes to bake. Otherwise, I'd do it live in front of you. Uh, and what you wind up with is all of these spheres, which are showing you what the light would look like at that point in space if you had a sphere. OK, so this shows that. And what happens when you turn those off is all those spheres actually give out that light. So that becomes your lighting solution, is all of these spheres. So if I turn off, say, the pro volumes just really quickly, and we go up to say, ooh, that's a little fast. Let's zoom that down. Uh, go into here. Oops, sorry, wrong key. To like light that with a light map would just look horrible. And it, it, you'd, the resolution of that light map would be ridiculous. It would take days and days and days back in the day to calculate. Uh, shoot, now just go use probe volumes. And if I turn those back on, you can see that the lighting around those probe volumes looks exactly like the lighting that's on, those, on that wall. Uh, of course, there's a little bit of a different material on that object, so it's a little bit different white. But essentially, it's that light contribution that we're seeing. Um, if we go down a little bit, mm -hmm, we can start to see, you know, it's not going to show you the direct illumination. So wherever you have a hard light coming through, that's direct illumination. It's the bounces that you see that are the, uh, the indirect. If I turn this off, we go to render debugger and let's turn on lighting, uh, light debug mode. Let's just see only the indirect diffuse lighting. So that's what we see here. So now this is all the lighting contribution that those spheres have given to the scene. Isn't that cool? Zoom back out. Uh, let's go to the very beginning. Oh, just past that thing. Cool. And let's take a look at Ann like so. And if I turn those volumes back on, or those probes, you can see that the lighting looks just like what it lights the surrounding area like. There you go, which is pretty cool. So a super neat way of lighting stuff. It's really fast. This is all available in, in the shipping version of Unity. Um, this, by the way, was done with 2022.1. This was done in beta 9, I believe. Uh, everything that you've seen here today, none of this is custom source code. Uh, there are a custom, few custom shaders, which will be released very soon, but otherwise it's stock Unity. Anybody can make this. The hair stuff is out today. Uh, just awesome. So that's cool. Last thing I want to show you is, let's turn this off. Go to our render volumes, turn off our probes. Cool. And also, let me just get back to a normal lighting, like so. And the last thing is the skin tension solver, which is awesome. So let's go here to our game view. Let's go here and let's make her look really weird for just a second. So we'll zoom right in. By the way, when she sticks her tongue out right there, I think that's just the demo team showing off. Like, no sticky lips. This, I mean, it is just showing off. That's why I told them, like, you guys are showing off. Anyhow, it's good. She doesn't really need that. Whatever. I'm mumbling because it's cool. Um, all right, so check this out. Let's go and select her head. Head geo. And she's got a couple shaders on her, her lower and upper body. So let's open those up. So this is the lower. Let's zoom past all that. This is the upper. And I'm going to show you. Let's, all right, so we have two, two textures on here. Let's open this one. Wait a minute. Um, make sure this is the right one. Oh, no, don't go to the Microsoft store. Ah, we don't want that. It's not, yeah, just stay away from that. Actually, all right, you know what? I'm going to do this. Let's go and open a different scene. I was going to just show you run quickly on this scene, but it's fine. This, this is a better way of showing it. Uh, scenes, A2, character, where is it at? Character tech demo. Cool. All right, so here she is without her hair. Go to our timeline. This, guy, this has a little bit more range of motion on it, so I'll stop right around there, frame 400. And let's grab her head. 
and geo and open up a couple of these textures. So there's that one, that's the lower body. This is the head. Perfect, double click on this one. Why is it doing that? All right, mm, this was set up. Whatever, we'll just do this. We won't see the texture map, which is fine. She's got a normal map on her. We've all seen a normal map. Uh, one of them is her normal map when she's wrinkled and the other was unwrinkled. Let's go to this shader. Uh, mm, and turn it on here, perfect. All right, so what is that? Uh, that's showing where her skin has tension and where there is no tension um, and where there's tension in between. So if I grab the timeline, and move this, the color changing that you're seeing is the skin showing where it's contracting and where it's compressed, or uh, stretching and contracting. So where it stretches, it's, mm, I wanna show the dang texture. Let me see if there's anything. Oh. <laughs> Don't understand. All right, anyway, there's the normal map. Uh, and we've got a unstretched version or unwrinkled, and then we've got the wrinkled version. And so wherever we see it change from red to green, we're gonna blend between those two textures. Uh, and it also there has, there's a blood map which does the same thing. So let's just zoom in on her lips. And oh, look at all the peach fuzz. And we'll just keep that there. Uh, so we zoom in on her lips and maybe I'll go to uh, my material setting here and I'll put this in to just to see our normals. And let me go right to frame 400. There's a nice place on her lips where we'll see this, this change. Let me back up a bit. See, do you see those, those wrinkles kind of go away and then they appear right there? Let me turn off normals and take a look at that again. Oh, let me turn off that uh, show tension, turn that off, cool. See that? That change is the skin tension solver doing that in real time. So this will work on any head. Doesn't matter how you create the animation. It could be a normal fax rig like we've all used. Uh, could be a 4D capture, could be a, a blend shape rig. Whatever you use, as long as there's skin that's squishing and stretching, this shader will work. Um, and this is available all as well in the, uh, the toolkit. The updated version will be out uh, with, uh, with 2023. So, this is a much nicer shader graph. Remember I told you I was gonna show you one that's nice? So this one is all labeled, tells you what's going on. You can follow this one through. Um, the other shader when it's released to you all will be all nice and compacted as well. But this is basically all the, all the technology. This is everything that's, that's calculating that red to green shift to do that skin tension solve, which it's again, it's just another one of those super subtle things that make all this believable. Um, to get past the uncanny valley and that's you know when you look at something and I see that that's fake. Uh, it's just because we're used to seeing people. So it's all these little tools, every one of these little subtle tools that, uh, that make it believable, you know? And we are so close to uh, living in a world where you can make fake anybody's. Um, after this presentation, so this, we're gonna be done here in about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, at five o'clock is real time live in ballroom C and D. If you thought this stuff was cool, Definitely run over there. Uh, we've got our team there who, we've got Lasse who created the hair technology. Uh, we've got a bunch of other people there who are gonna show taking Ziva, if you don't know what Ziva is, Ziva is an AI tool that can learn and solve faces. We've basically taken Louise, where'd she go? She's around here somewhere. Well, she's Anne or Louise, there she's with. Zoom in on, there we go, oh, there we go. So we've basically taken her uh, we've taken about 20 minutes of her performance, send it to the cloud to compute with uh, Ziva's AI technology. It created a rig that is incredibly lightweight, like 50 megabytes, which has the equivalent of like tens of thousands or 10,000 blend shapes. And you move little nodes around and uh, she, using artificial intelligence, drives that rig. Kind of hard to explain without seeing it, but my mind was actually absolutely blown when they took her performance from enemies, swapped heads with a, a younger model named Emma, and it's the same performance with the same subtleties, only with a different head. Uh, that's what they're gonna show real time live for this crowd and for film, groundbreaking, amazing. I've never seen anything like it. So go check that out. Uh, it's in ballroom C and D right after this presentation. So yeah, and they're also gonna show a little bit more on the hair. Um, some of, the, uh, some of the other cool tech you can do with hair that's not human hair, so like fur, animals, things like that. So 
anyway, that is the end of what I was going to show. Saved a little bit of time for Q&A. So if anyone's got some questions, shoot, let me know. Yes. Um, yeah, just for the tier lines, how did you guys get the nice reflection on a transparent? Is the extra geo on the tier line? There's a, there's a little chunk of geometry in there that just has a shader that uh, that does just that. And that'll, that's in the toolkit as well. Gotcha. And the second is for the hair collision. Uh, does it support, is it only a sort of primitive or you can do any complex collision mesh? For the hair? Any complex collision. I know there's spheres and cubes in there, but like when, mm -hmm. when it's moving on her face, you can see it kind of fall down her nose. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's anything, any, any shape as complex as you'd like. Um, sure. So one last one. Yep. The, uh, so the tension map, uh, can you talk just briefly about how does it calculate the tension? Is it like a surface distance or what's the, uh, what's under the hood? So the way it was explained to me, I didn't write it, but the way it was explained to me, it's, it's fairly straightforward. As points come together, it, it evaluates the whole scene and just sees these points are coming together and it's causing these to stretch just calculates that math and there you go. And if you if you dive into that shader graph, it if you can read those, it actually reads pretty well. Uh, if you come to the show floor tomorrow, she we can dice, we can walk you through that one. Anyone else? Yes. Why thank you. Um, I was wondering with the uh, the groom that you brought over from like XGen, um, are you bringing over just like the guide curves or are you bringing like a full groom into Unity? It comes in as a full groom. So I, I believe it's in an Alembic format as well, um, but it just comes over as a, as a base mesh. The one thing I didn't show is there's a texture map that's on her scalp, which is color coded, a lot of different colors, which define each one of the, the clumps. And that comes from whatever DCC package you're using as well. Gotcha. So then you're defining all of that stuff externally to Unity, and then Correct. here you're just doing you're using it purely for render and simulation. Correct. And the reason for that was there's four packages, if not more, that do that. Why reinvent the wheel? Um, focus on the focus on getting it right in the engine. And I'm you know I'm sure at some point we'll we'll work on some tools like that. Like I said, Barbershop is coming out soon, so don't really know what the plans are for that. But maybe part of that gets integrated in there, or there's a standalone or something. But but yeah, all the just like modeling, you know, you don't do all of your modeling inside of Unity, but um, there's plenty of tools that allow you to do that. Gotcha. And actually, um, the cloth simulation, because you mentioned that the, the character itself was an Olympic cache. Yes. Um, and I was wondering, like, with the cloth simulation you had as well, was that an external cache as well, or is that running? Um, that is a great question. So here, I've got a, I got a couple minutes. Let me show you the cloth. So <laughs> the cloth is was created with Marvelous Designer, which does a great job with cloth. And let's just go here. That's zoomed in quite a ways. And let's just zoom, focus on her head, then I can drive around a little bit. Oh, go lock the timeline. Yeah, her cloth is, uh, her cloth is very pretty. Uh, let's get here. Now the mouse is moving. Yeah, so this is a streaming Alembic cache. Uh, we, you know, so in house we designed this this outfit, but it's just super beautiful. All those wonderful little. Uh, what do you? Become? I'm not a clothing designer, so I don't know what you call that stuff. Those little doodad doodads, <laughs> all the doodads that are on her are are very cool. So yeah, it's a it's a. There's not a lot of animation on there, but it's all. It comes in as a cache as well. Uh, you know, we've, we've done a good job, I think, with streaming Alembics in, so you can stream that on a console, PC. Um, it, it's actually not even that heavy, so uh, yes, Joshua. Alembic. And I just had one final question. Sure. Uh, how many people and how long did it take to, to make this uh, piece? That's a great question. Um, so the entire, so it started with Gwen uh, for the Heretic, and then about 18 months ago uh, with COVID and the entire team being separated, not working together like they usually did. It took them about 18 months uh, from start to finish, uh, nine people. The, the thing that's important to remember though is unlike a lot of normal production, I shouldn't say like unlike a lot of, I can't talk today, not unlike a lot of normal productions, they did a lot of R&D. So, oh, we have to invent hair, you know? So that was part of that, um, we, you know, like 
some pretty big heavy lifting was in that in that time frame. So it wasn't just taking a hair system and applying it. It was okay. We've got to invent that. We've got to expand this shader. There's a lot of things that we had to do um, in order to get there. So uh, I'd say they probably could have done it in ten months without all that R and D, but uh, eighteen or a year and a half. Yes, and the there. So the idea for this, this is the teaser. Uh, hopefully it gets done, but the idea was going to have, be to have like two players playing chess, both puppets being driven by Ziva, and you know you could record your face with your phone and see the one move or move some points. Uh, so hopefully we'll see that. But they are working on their next project, which is pretty amazing too, so I don't know if they'll do both. Uh, we'll see. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, sorry. We'll get to you next. Sorry. Yes. Uh I just want to know about uh, a more future thing. This is really awesome. I, uh, in terms of how many characters you think can be put with this simulation and worked on at a time frame on, uh, say, a 3090 card, like, you know, a, a good config? I had about 20 objects, very high resolution, spinning all around. Um, and it wasn't slow. I mean, the the... the the main reason we've got a 3090 is the ray tracing. Okay. So people, there, this runs great on my laptop that's four or five years old. It runs on my Mac. I was playing around with my MacBook and I was spinning hair around really nicely. So you should be able to get, and you know, what? you could crank down the number of strands if it gets a little bit slow. Uh, there's some really cool level of detail stuff that they'll show in real time live. So as the camera gets closer, you can dynamically spawn more strands or cause more strands to start to animate, which is kind of nice. So it doesn't get this, it's not a jarring effect as you get closer. Um, but I haven't actually done a, a proper how many test. So I don't want to give you a wrong answer, but I have had like 20 objects with a, a nice full simulation hair going and it was fine. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I thought it was super cool that you were actually showing this uh, this reel with a with a demo as well. I'm kind of curious, like like just from a filmmaking perspective, like because I would imagine you have some kind of computational budget on how much you can have in your scene, right? Like when you were kind of designing this this set and and uh, deciding what to what to fill it with, right? Like, did you get to a point where like actually we we ca we can't do this thing, we have to scale it back, or or like how did you decide that kind of design, so to say? No, what's really interesting about uh, so uh, a guy named Vess is the creative director, and he's here at the show as well. Uh, he doesn't think polygons at all, doesn't care about them. It's just make it whatever. So there's tens of millions of polygons in this scene. There is very little as far as geometry optimization. Uh, it just didn't need it. We just, it just was always on target. Um, even once we turned on all the, all of the, the fancy features, it just held up. So the biggest, the biggest bottleneck is the ray tracing at the moment. So turn that off and I mean, Unity handles extremely large poly counts. Anyway, I know on like the industrial size, I've seen CAD models from from Audi and, and, and uh, Lexus that are in the hundreds of millions of polygons and they still spin around in VR at you know 90 frames a second, no problem. So uh, it's when you start to put a lot of the icing on that can cause you some slowdowns. So maybe sometimes just scrape a little bit of that, that, that off, but there wasn't a, a ton of optimization in this. It just, in, in fact, it was kind of weird. Like the team originally wanted this to run at, it was either 24 or 30 frames a second for artistic look. And sometimes when you're doing, not sometimes, when you're doing simulation, your frame rate is a huge part of how that simulation is going to run. There is a separate clock for the hair that's uh, separate from the rendering uh, clock. So this might have been running at 90 frames a second with rendering ray tracing turned off. The hair could be simulating at 30 frames a second is what, kind of what I'm saying. Um, where was I going with that? Um, you got it. I got it. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, cool, thank you. One more. So uh, I, I was curious about the probe volumes that you showed. Yes. Uh, how is it set up? I might have missed. And how does it deal with uh, light changing and uh, the whole environment changing in in mute? Because you said it's a bake of ten it, minutes. Yeah. Uh, it it it's kind of hard to say. It depends on a lot of things. Obviously, the bake the bake time is not nearly as bad as as light probes were or light maps were. Uh, it's it's pretty quick, and you can make changes to them over if you're seeing changes dramatically. But in this one, they just stay consistent. And uh, but how is it set up? I might have missed it. Oh, so the so the setup is you create a volume, uh, and then just 
add the pro volume components to it, and it just generates this, this set of spheres. And you can define, like if I leave the scene, if I leave the room, and this is right during the transformation, so let the transformation finish, or go out here rather, and I'll turn pro, pro volumes on really quick. So outside, we don't have nearly as many probes, or volumes rather, as we do inside. So there's several different volumes with several different densities inside. So it's just a slider that you set up how many probes you want. Um, depends how, you have a lot, like for all that little detail, you need a lot of probes. So that's why there's a lot of probes on the inside. Outside, there's not nearly as much detail to slide those down. I think we're done. One more. Three minutes. Hello, oh, super cool presentation. Uh, just to keep on on the light subject, so you said that the probes were being baked, so see if you have a lot of animation of the lighting, like real time, very different lighting, like how does it go? So it's only calculating the indirect lighting. So if you have a lot of direct lighting changes, they'll still be the, the dominant thing that's gonna light your scene. So it should be all right, and if it, you know, if you've got a lot, if you're in a disco and you've got a lot of crazy light changes, then maybe pro, the volumes isn't the way to go. Um, so it's just sort of, does it work for your project? And if it does, then fantastic. Um, I think that's the best way to answer that. I, to be honest, I've only used them in this scene, and you know, I've set them up from scratch with a couple little test scenes, but nothing really big like this. This was already created, so. Um, haven't spent too much time seeing what happens if you start throwing other alternative light sources on it since it just these tools just came out, but uh, I will. I can let you know later. Thanks. Sure. Cool. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.